We've had another death in the community. Todd passed away yesterday. And so each of us has to think about two people. One, we think about Todd. Wish him well where he's gone. Dedicate the merit of our sit. Dedicate the merit of the chanting to his well-being, wherever he's taken rebirth. Some people wonder about the practice of dedicating merit. The Buddha talks about it. He's asked by a Brahmin one time, when you dedicate merit, does it actually get to the other person? And the answer is yes, if they're in a place where they are capable of receiving it. In other words, they know about it and they have the chance to express their appreciation. This is why in one of the basic chants for dedicating merit, there's a phrase that says, May they know of this and rejoice in the merit, and if they don't know, may the devas inform them. In other words, may they get the chance to express their appreciation, because that appreciation itself is the merit that they gain. The other person we think about, of course, is ourselves. The fact that the Buddha told us to think every time we think about a dead person, that that is our fate. We haven't gone beyond that yet. It makes us look at our lives. We have some time left. We have some energy left. What are we going to do with that time? What are we going to do with that energy? We know we have some energy now. We know we have some time now. So let's make the best use of it. And what do you take when you go? You want to prepare in a way that leads to long-term happiness. The Buddha taught the three characteristics, or the three perceptions, the three contemplations, as a tool in helping us to sharpen our vision as to what true happiness would be and where we can find it and how we can find it. He doesn't say why he focused on these three things, aside from the fact that they do provoke feelings of disenchantment, dispassion, because it's the passion that we have for fabricating our worlds of being, our sense of who we are and the world we inhabit. The passion is what keeps that going. And if we learn to develop dispassion for that process, okay, then the mind is released. But you have to do it in stages. You don't just drop everything and go off and lie down on the, floor, on the ground and hope for everything to end. First, you have to develop good, skillful states in the mind. This is why we're concentrating, working on concentration, working on mindfulness as we stay with the breath, to develop a good, solid state of becoming inside. So we have something with which to help us peel away all the really unskillful desires we have. This is one area where the three characteristics are useful. There are two ways that you can look at them. One is from the perspective of that question the Buddha says is the foundation of discernment. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And the three important concepts in that question, my long-term happiness. And so the three characteristics are meant to show that if you find something that is not long-term, in other words, inconstant, it's going to be stressful, so it can't be happiness. And then why would you want to claim it as yours? So use these three contemplations to look at perspective ways of spending your time, perspective ways of deciding what you want to hold on to, what you want to work toward. And you ask yourself, is it really worth it? Is this going to lead to any kind of happiness that's really worthy of the name? Anything that you would want to claim? Because the mind has this tendency to keep on creating new issues all the time. And so when there's a temptation to create a new world and a new identity in that world, you look at it. Is this something that's going to be long-term? Is it going to be something that's going to help lead to the end of suffering? Or is it going to lead to more suffering? And if you see that it's inconstant, 
then the next question you have to ask, of course, is, is this part of the path or is it something that leads you away from the path? It's the Buddhist strategy is that you do have to use things that are inconstant and have some amount of stress as part of the path. But as for things that you can clearly see are not part of the path, okay, then you really do want to analyze them in terms of seeing how inconstant they are, the stress that's part of that inconstancy. Then the question is, do you really want that? Do you really want to lay claim to that? That's one way of contemplating these three characteristics or these three contemplations. Then once the path has been brought to its culmination, okay, that's when you apply the same analysis to the, the aggregates that form the path, the, the form of the body sitting here meditating, the feelings of pleasure you've created through concentration, the perception that holds you in concentration, the fabrications that maintain the intention to stay in con concentration, and your awareness of these things. There is a point where you want to take these apart as well. This is where that passage from John Munn comes in where he says that your, our attachment to what's good can get in the way. The concentration is good, but it's not totally good. It still lacks something in terms of providing true happiness, because you will find that it is, too is inconstant. Even the pleasure of the concentration has some stress. So why would you want to lay claim to it? Why would you want to have passion for it? So at the right time, this series of perceptions or these series of contemplations can be applied to everything. That's one perspective on the three characteristics. The other perspective, and you think in terms of those Dharma summaries that Ratabala taught to the king, the world is swept away, it does not endure. It offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. It's a slave to craving. Those first three summaries are related. The world is swept away. Things change. Inconstancy. The illustration, of course, that Ratabala gave to the king was the fact that he asked him, are you as strong now as you were when you were 20 years old? The king, who was now 80 years old, said, not in no way at all. When I was young, I thought I had the strength of two men. Now when I think I'm going to put my foot in one place, it goes someplace else. It's a teaching on inconstancy. Aging is the big illustration for inconstancy. You can get things really, really good in terms of a good relationship and whatever, but then everybody grows old. That's it. The world offers no shelter. You know, the king was curious. How can you say it has no shelter? I've got a palace. I've got armies to protect me. So as Ratabal asks him, do you have a recurring illness? The king does. It's a wind illness, which in those days meant shooting pains through the body. And so when you're there, lying ill in bed with this wind illness, and people are hovering around to see whether you're going to die yet, can you ask them to share some of the pain? And even though he's king, he can't do that. So the teachings on stress are related to illness. The world has nothing of its own. Again, the king who has lots of possessions, so how can you say that? And Rantabella asks him, well, can you take those possessions with you into the next life? And of course you can't. You have to leave them behind. So death is a big teaching on not self. Even your body has to be left behind. All your memories of this lifetime, all your activities and projects in this lifetime, you've got to drop them at the moment of death. This is a big wall, suddenly between you and the things that were very intimately yours before. Well, they seem to be yours. You had some control over them, but now you realize that ultimately there's some big areas we can't control them at all. So the teaching on inconstancy relates to aging, the teaching on stress relates to illness. The teaching on not-self relates to death. The final Dharma summary refers to the fact that we keep going for this sort of stuff over and over again. So the solution, of course, will be to learn how to learn not to have passion and craving for these things. Because the fourth Dharma summary is that we're slaves to craving. 
Ratabala illustrates this with a series of questions. He asks the king, suppose someone came and told you there was a kingdom off to the east that you could conquer easily and has lots of wealth. Here's the king who's 80 years old and already has a, a fine kingdom, but no, he'd, he'd be happy to mount an army and send them off to conquer that. How about if there was another country into the south, another one to the west, another one to the north, and one on the other side of the ocean? The king said, yeah, I'd go for that. It shows how insatiable craving can be. And it's the craving that keeps us coming back to these things that age, grow ill, and die over and over and over again. So the summary, of course, points to the problem and also points to the solution. It's learning how to develop some dispassion for these processes, these forms and feelings and perceptions and fabrications and moments of consciousness that we keep going after and fabricating again and again and again. So on the one hand, we're stuck with aging illness, and on the other hand, we want happiness. And if you bring some wisdom to your search for happiness, you'll learn how to use the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self to save you from getting passionate about things that are going to age, grow ill, and die. So this is how we think when we are confronted with a sudden death as we had today. We're going to die, too. Where are you going to put your energy? Where are you going to focus your time? However much time you have left, because you don't really know. The Buddha says that the only people who are really heedful are the ones who say, can I have one more in and out breath? I'll try to make the most of that, but that amount of time. If you stretch out the amount of time saying, well, but can I have another day or another half day, he says, you're heedless. The practice is something that has to be done with each in and out breath. You have to be on top of your mind with each in and out breath, because if you're caught in a moment of heedlessness, it's really hard to gather all your forces together, scrambling around. when you suddenly have to go. So try to be prepared. Use these perceptions in a way that will fulfill their purpose, which is to lead to not only a long-term happiness, but a happiness that's totally unconditioned. That's the wise way to respond to the fact of aging, illness, and death all around us. remembering that these things are in us as well.